much, and thank you to Jean-Michel for the invitation to come to such a, an important conference and in such spectacular circumstances. Well, I'm supposed to talk about what we need to do to achieve the integrated energy market and how well we're getting on with that task. And to that end, I want to look at the two key driving policies, uh, the two target models, uh, and briefly explain why they are critical, and in particular, what they are trying to achieve is competitive cross-border trading. And my message is going to be that contract trading ahead of time, as well as spot trading, is critical, and that will require the active intervention of regulatory agencies, supported, of course, by ACER and the European Commission. So how well are we doing? The target electricity model, I think, is making reasonably good progress, and critically, it is now coupling over a wider area. Uh, there is a problem because there isn't enough capacity to trade across borders, and the investment in transmission is lagging behind. Uh, and we have an energy-only market design, which I'm going to show su or suggest may need modification. In the gas market, uh, I think progress is slower, and the gas market is critical for electricity as well, um, for the very simple reason that in many markets, the price of electricity is set by the price of gas. Uh, this takes a very good example, the British electricity market, which is very much a gas-driven market, and this shows the red line is the forward price of baseload electricity for 2010, traded from 2007 onwards. And what you will see is as the forward price of gas rises, so the forward price of electricity rises. Um, coal is following behind as well. So if we were able to achieve a uniform price of gas across Europe, then the prices of electricity in each market would tend to converge without the need to trade so much, and that would reduce the pressure on these very limited interconnection capacities. Uh, but it's more important than that because security of supply for both electricity and gas uh, depends critically on liquidity in markets and a European-wide market. Um, and it needs gas-on-gas -gas competition, not oil index competition. Uh, so the stakes are high, and the evidence of progress is not quite so convincing. Uh, this is after the markets have been coupled, so this is the forward prices for 2012, and you will see that the wholesale prices for baseload electricity are still not converging, and that suggests that interconnection capacity is unfortunately too limited. Market coupling has been absolutely crucial in making better use of the interconnection that we have, this limited interconnection. And the dark blue and slightly lighter blue areas show the area that is now coupled so that the markets are being efficiently used. And even the uh, cross-hatched areas, uh, Britain is now interconnected to the Netherlands by Britned, which is market coupled, but we're not properly market coupled to France. Now, what market coupling means is that all of the power exchanges, the bids and offers, are submitted to a single auction house. And that auction house tries to find a single price for a, as wide an area as possible, ideally, of course, the whole of Europe. But the trade that would be implied in moving power from low to high price areas may not be feasible with the interconnection. And if that's the case, then the the prices in separate zones have to equilibrate supply and demand given the imports and exports. And that means that the export zones will have lower prices and the import zones will have higher prices. So far, so good. But if we look at the time it has taken us to get here and the cost that we've incurred, uh, this is before market coupling and this gives the price differences over a year for a megawatt of transmission capacity between neighboring markets. And you will see that Spain to France, to take a very good example, um, is 100,000 euros a megawatt per year, or 100 million euros for a 1,000 megawatt interconnector. 
Uh, now, that is a highly profitable investment, and it's been delayed now for many, many years. <clears throat> the evidence that prices vary considerably across the country is evident. Fortunately, there is some price convergence. Um, if we were to go beyond 2011 with more market coupling, that would continue. But industrial prices need contracts as well as spot markets if they're going to achieve convergence. Uh, and that is challenging, and that is where the regulators are going to become important. <clears throat> Let me give you a very simple example. What you would ideally like to do if you're a, a consumer in a country is to be able to contract ahead perhaps up to three years for your power. Now, you can do that with your local generator, but he is probably an incumbent with considerable market power. You would like to have competitive offers from a, a foreign country. Let's consider a country, uh, two countries, connected with a two gigawatt link, uh, and at the moment, um, they can sell from the cheaper to the more expensive market. But if we have firm financial transmission rights, which would be issued by the transmission system operator, and they will only be issued if the regulators force them to do that, then those two gigawatts of exports from A to B can be matched by four gigawatts, because that nets down to two, um, and that's the capacity of the interconnector selling from B to A. Uh, so as B loses its customers, it can sell to customers in A, and A will have lost some customers, and so it can then sell in total six gigawatts, because six gigawatts minus four is two gigawatts. So you can see that the ability to net out trade, which requires firm obligations ahead of time, makes each of these markets far more contestable than would otherwise be the case. But we will only get that if the regulators insist that the transmission system operators issue these financial transmission rights. <clears throat> we have other challenges. Um, wind penetration is increasing, and if I were to look ahead to our target for 2020 in Britain um, and ask what would happen if we had the wind conditions of 2003, you will see that over a period of 10 hours we could have lost 18 gigawatts of power. That needs reserve capacity, which isn't going to run very much of the time, and it needs to be flexible. If we want people to invest in that capacity, they will need assurance about their revenue, and that will almost certainly require a capacity market. Uh, so the capacity markets are going to be important, but also wind varies in its location, and so the markets are going to have to respond very much more quickly than day-ahead trading at the moment. We are going to need intraday and balancing across borders if we're going to make advantage of the renewables that come on the system. And you can already see how this is working. If you look at Denmark, uh, the light yellow area is the volume of wind that's being produced in the east and the west of Denmark. And the darker yellow is the exports of that wind. So at short notice, large quantities of wind will flow over the borders into other countries. And therefore, those transactions across borders and the markets dealing with them around Europe will have to be able to respond in time periods of hours, not day ahead. So we need better balancing and intraday markets. <clears throat> if we come on to the gas market, and I've said that gas is critical for security of supply and also for integrating the electricity market, uh, then there are some encouraging trends. Uh, hubs are emerging, and the prices on these different hubs are converging, and that suggests that these hubs are reasonably liquid. One of the consequences of that has been to undermine the oil indexed contracts, which are particularly important from Russia uh, into Central Europe. And you can see that the oil index German import tariffs have now slightly delinked, or the import price has delinked from the indexed contracts and is clearly being influenced by these hub trading prices. So liquidity here is having a competitive effect on the market. But it's not translating yet into uniformity of industrial prices. 
And that matters because you can move gas around once you have the transmission system remarkably cheaply. And so we should expect that these neighboring countries should have very similar uh, gas prices. And again, it's a problem of contracting and trading ahead of time. You can see that in contrast to electricity, industrial gas prices are not only very variable across the union, but they seem to be diverging, not converging, which is, after all, the purpose of trying to integrate the market. Now, fortunately, we're going to get a much more extensive exposition of what needs to be done to try and improve the integration of the markets, because Jeff Markham will be able to explain in more length than I have available what the problem is. And unfortunately, uh, Britain often leads the way in showing how to liberalize markets. Uh, the model that seems to have been adopted in gas was copied from the British model of entry-exit pricing. We have six entry points and about 150 exit points. And in order to define prices for entry and exit, instead of saying, well, we have six times 150 possible routes from supply to demand, they said, let's just make it six plus 150 and create a virtual trading hub, uh, which itself has liquidity, but it means that it's impossible to define capacity between any two points. And if you don't have capacity defined, then you can't trade capacity. And if you can't trade capacity, then you can't integrate markets with forward contracts. Um, and that, I would suggest, is the way we need to go. Uh, so how can you get around this? Well, each country may have its own internal pricing arrangements, but the crucial thing are the long-distance pipelines, uh, and we need to be able to trade capacity on those. We also need to be able to contest and build more capacity. And if we did that, and if we created the necessary liquidity, then we will have done much to increase security of supply in the gas market. So, to conclude, the target electricity model is going in the right direction. It's only taken us 20 years to get here, but um, nevertheless, we now seem to be uh, going at a reasonable pace towards extensive market coupling. Uh, the next step is to make better use of those interconnections ahead of time by having long-term firm financial transmission rights, not the physical transmission options that we use at the moment. Uh, and we will need, as wind becomes more important, uh, to develop better intraday and balancing markets. I think we also will have to worry about the market design, whether energy-only markets are going to be fit for purpose, and whether wide area zones will be able to cope with the fluctuating supplies of wind uh, that will become increasingly important, not to mention PV. I've said that the gas market has problems. Um, there's a lot of market power remaining, which uh, is not helped by regulated prices, which create divergences between countries. Uh, part of the reason is that it is difficult to trade gas over long distances, and the present model of entry-exit pricing doesn't seem to work very well for large areas like the European Union. And if we wanted a good model, the United States has demonstrated a remarkably resilient and flexible model, very competitive. It was able to withstand the Hurricane Katrina, which drenched the trading hub under six feet of water. But if you look at the prices, there's hardly a blip. Uh, so the resilience of that market is a demonstration that security of supply comes with competition as well. Thank you very much.